Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ellie, and today with Celine, we are going to talk to you about Blizzard new game Hearthstone. Uh, just a quick disclaimer before we get started. Uh, this is a personal work, and it do not represent in any way our respective employer point of view. That being said, uh, if you are looking for a new job, Google is hiring. So if you are interested, come to talk to me after the talk. Had to do it, guys. Uh, and then, uh, with that out of the way, let's get started. So, Hearthstone is a Digital, collect uh, digital collectible card game uh, released by Blizzard earlier this year. Uh, it is based on the universe of World of Warcraft and um, it's an amazingly addictive game. So, with everything which is too interesting, sometimes unintended consequences happen. Uh, for us, uh, at some point uh, during the last few months, we started to be more and more interested into how the game is structured. Uh, how we can understand it better and building tools for it rather than playing it, which at the end was resulted by us not playing the game at all. Uh, I remember, like, for instance, from May to June, I think I played only up to level five and probably like a hundred games, which is a huge dawn from uh, beta where I used to play every day. But it's an amazing game. If you haven't tried it, you should. Uh, it's free to play. It's available on your uh, computer, Mac, and PC, and also on a mobile version, uh, tablet, iPad, and hopefully anytime soon in uh, Android. So, looking at this, uh, it also was a very good excuse for me because I finally convinced my wife to come on stage with me and do a deaf tongue call. That's something I really wanted for a long time. So, that's her first talk. So, please be nice with her. Uh. <laughs> All right. So, what are we talking about today? Today, we're going to talk about uh, game complexity. Uh, Hearthstone have about uh, 500 cards now. And complexity creates bias. And the question is can we use this bias? Can we exploit them? Can we find things which make us give us an edge? And that's what this talk is about. Uh, we wrote about our research and sent it to Blizzard. Uh, I don't know if some of them are in the room, but we didn't get any response, so I think they're fine with it. Uh, <laughs> you know, no answer means yes, right? Uh, so, why we wanted to talk to you? Uh, first thing we want to tell you about how to find undervalued cards. So each card has a value and the question is are they better bang for the buck than others? Uh, the second thing we wanted to tell you and the other thing we really kept under the wrap and we didn't advertise at all so far in the surprise of the DEF CON is can you predict what your opponent is going to play? Yes it's possible and we're going to show you how to a certain extent. Uh, the, we also wanted to tell you about how to predict the game outcome. Uh, it's very interesting, except we don't have time. 45 minutes is too short. So we'll write a blog post about it. And of course, we wanted to tell you about the impending alien invasion. Uh, no, wait. No, <laughs> not this one. So, how many of you play Hearthstone? Can you please raise your hand? Not everyone. Okay. How many of you reach Legend? No one. Okay. Well. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> that being said, for those who never seen Hearthstone, here is what a, a normal game looks like. So it's a board game. It's a turn by turn, and it's two players. Uh, each each person is represented as a hero, which is inspired by uh, World of Warcraft characters. Uh, you are at the bottom. Here I'm playing Valera, which is the rogue hero, and my opponent is playing Hagen, which is a uh, solo player only uh, hero. The game ends w when one of the two heroes reach health pool reach zero. Uh, the health pool is, is on the right side of your portrait. And so how do you kill people? Well, you use decks and the decks contain cards. 30 cards for each player is a hard limit. You can do only 30, not 29, no one 20, 31, just 30. And each card has special effect. So every turn you draw a card and the, guard, the card goes into your hand. Uh, this is my hand and you can see one of the cards is highlighted in green. It means I have enough mana to play it. The mana is the resource you use to play cards. Uh, your opponent also have a hand. You only see the back of it uh, obviously because you don't want to tip people's hands. Uh, for those who are curious, no. The game do not know the card ahead of time and no you can't cheat with that. I checked. Uh, so, how the mana pool, as I said, is depicted on the right side. It goes from one of the first turn up to ten as a turn ten. After turn ten, it keep being replenished, but do not increase. So the maximum amount of mana you can have at a given time is ten. 
so a card can be multiple things. They can be either weapon or spare, which you played immediately. They can also be what we call minions or creatures. Uh, you can have up to seven on the board for each player. Yours are at the bottom. Your opponent are at the top. Here you can see, for instance, I'm playing Van Cliff, and my opponent have three minions which are on the top. Okay, so that's basically what Hearthstone looks like when you play it. Uh, it's obviously designed to play on a um, tablet. It has really been designed like this, uh, and they simplify a lot compared to Magic because, for instance, you don't have to deal with uh, land, which is the resource economy. So it's very simple. They try to make it very, very easy for people to get in and get their first uh, free shot before buying cards, which is how they make money. Uh, that being said, there is a lot of complexity as we will see. Uh, here is a quick uh, video of uh, me playing uh, Hearthstone in um, non ranking mode just to show you the game. So you can see this is my turn, so I'm playing. My card do a special effect, bring a new card into game. I draw a card which goes to my hand, I play another card, and I click end of the turn, and then my opponent have a secret which is a trigger effect. And that's basically what the turn looks like. Uh, on the video, it looks awesome because the guy plays really fast. Uh, Sometimes you have up to 90 seconds to play a turn, so you have to wait and drink your coffee. So uh, some people try to actually play two games at once. Uh, so what makes the game so interesting are cards. Everything is a card. If you look at how the game is structured, actually your hero is a card. Everything in the game is modeled as a card, and the card is a big, is a thing we're going to look at in depth in this first part. So a card have a minion here, the, the Yeti, have at least four attributes. The first one is the mana, which is a cost you pay to play the card, as I said, from one, from zero, sorry, to ten. And then you have basic attributes in this card, which is attack, uh, four here, and health, five. So that's the card, and this is a very boring card. I mean, the illustration is nice, but nothing special about this card. What makes the game fun is there is a lot of cards which have a lot of interesting effects. Uh, these are three of my favorite cards uh, Van Cleef, the Fairy Dragon, and the Cabal Shadow Priest. And what's very interesting is you can combine all those effects and do unintended or very special combo, and that's basically how you win the game. So, finding good synergy between cards is one of the fun aspects of the game. So, now that we know cards, the question is is there a better card or card which have a better bang for the box than others? How we find those? Well, let's start first with the theory. I know it's early in the morning and the head hurts, but bear with me, please. Uh, we're going to start with the basic assumption of how we're going to model this. Uh, the first thing is the mana cost is proportional to the card power, which means that if you play a one mana card, it has it's less powerful than a two mana card, which is less powerful than a three mana card. If you haven't that, the game is broken because everyone would play just the most powerful thing, which is one, and overrun people. No, Zoo is not that overpowerful for people who play it. Uh, it is a little bit unbalanced, but not that so much. Uh, two is the power of the card roughly increased linearly, which means a two mana card is roughly twice as powerful than the one mana card. Uh, if this hypothesis is not true, it means that a if it was exponential, which means the highest card would be vastly superior to the lowest card, then Rush Deck would have no chance of success. As the opposite, if it was a log scale, then long-term games, which we call control deck, would have no chance of success. So roughly the linear is something you need to be able to um, to have the game balanced between short term and long term. Uh, it's not quite linear, but it's a reasonable assumption. Uh, card have a constant card effect have a constant price. It means that a divin shield or any effect have the same price regardless of the card it's in. There is no discount for a specific card, there is no secret, all of it's in the card. Which brings us to the fourth one, which is having a card has value. Remember, you only get one card each turn, so even holding a card has some value, which we call the intrinsic value of the card. And finally, uh, we believe there is no secret. We believe Blizzard has no hidden component, hidden balancing factor, and what you have in the card is exactly what the value of the card should be, so if we were summing all the attributes, you would get the value of the card. The question is how you sum them is another question we're going to explore, but there is nothing secret about it, and we believe everything in the game, and you can actually look at it. So that's where we're starting. So, how do we model a card? Well, as I said, the mana is a price, so the price is equal to uh, the attack and the health and the intrinsic value of my Yeti. There is nothing else on the card, so we assume that the mana is exact, the price of in mana is exactly the sum of those attributes. Uh, you put it into a linear function, don't worry, it's very simple. Uh, you say, well, four mana is four 
attacks where A is basically what we call the attack coefficient which is the base point how much mana it costs to have one attack plus five health where H is the coefficient for health which is a base point how much one health point costs in mana plus I which is the interesting value of the card which is how much mana does it cost to even hold the card. So with that you can already even look without looking at the coefficient just yet you can compare two cards. So take another very common card which is the uh, boulder fist ogre which is heavily played in arena and uh, we can also put it in a question right six mana is six attacks plus seven health plus the interesting value and we want to compare it to our chill wind Gilly. So same thing well not really easy to compare so we're going to be very very high tech. We're going to go back to fourth grade and we're going to just divide by six. Yes that's really hard I know. And then it gives you one mana point. So for one mana point you get one attack, 1 1.16 health and the interesting value of the card. On the other hand we're going to divide by four. And by doing this you say well for one mana point what you get is one attack and 1.25 health plus the interesting value. And here you can immediately see that one of them get better bang for the box. The Yeti gets more health point per mana point than the boulder fist ogre. And that's the kind of imbalance we're going to look for. Uh, let me give you a more interesting example. Fireball, my most hated card. I hate to be killed by a fireball but that's a very simple thing for those who don't know what a fireball is. It's a big ball of fire that people throw at you <laughs> and you die. That's uh, what it is. And so basically this one is very simple to model. You pay four mana and you basically blast the guy with six damage or a creature. So very simple to model. One mana is 1.5 damage. All right. And they're like well you know a fireball is great. How about we make a giant fireball. It's called a pyroblast. Bigger. Stronger. Meaner. And the pyroblast is basically ten mana and for ten mana at this time you get ten damage. Well okay but then in that case it might be bigger but uh, the bank for the, the value is not that great. Uh, you get one mana one damage and you can immediately see that's not quite right. If you have ten mana you can play two fireball and a half for the price of one pyroblast. So the value of the pyroblast is less interesting than the fireball. What's interesting is this is a new version of the pyroblast. Uh, earlier in the year we had a pre nerf version which used to cost eight mana where that time the mana cost was even lower than the fireball. Where basically before they adjust the value uh, we get 1.25 damage for one mana. So something is not right here right? Um, let's compare the two. If you take 10 damage it implies that the fireball should do 4 damage not 6. And you're like well okay but no the fire fireball is properly priced. You should do 6 damage for 4. Well in that case I want a pyroblast should do 15 damage not 10. Give me back my pyroblast. Uh, so that's basically the idea of this imbalance right. Even if you look at simple coefficients you can see that there are some decisions which are you can debate. The qu uh, of course we don't have all the data that Blizzard have and they probably are just based on statistical analysis but deep down the mechanics is something where there is some sort of this mismatch in complexity that is the basic core idea of finding on the valued card. Okay. So how do we for how do we scale that to hundreds of cards? Uh, more precisely we're able to do 130 cards uh, because modeling each attribute is a little bit complicated so you have to do you have to parse text. It turns out that the card is really like a bunch of text that you have to process and say oh that's how this attribute and so forth. So we did 130 for this talk. Um, how we do that? Well we model the card as we did before. Then we use those cards and reverse the coefficient of each A, H, and so forth using linear algebra. Don't worry, it's not as bad as it sounds. And then uh, you use those reverse coefficients to compute what we call the real value of the card. And then the last step is the easiest step where you say, well, here's my real value, here's my face value. You subtract one to the other, and if it's a negative, well, you find another value card that's as simple as this. Well, easier said than done, but not that bad. So, let me show you on a very simple example, five cards, how it looked like. And then when we know that, I will show you the real results. So, let's take three cards which have charge. Charge is basically you put a card and the card can attack as soon as it is come into play. Uh, so we have four, we have the Corcoran, uh, the, Rock the Rocketeers, and the Argent Commander. And we're going to show two more cards, which is 
which have Divin shield. And the reason why the Argent Commander is in the middle is because it has both attributes. And one of the ideas of having linear algebra is you can commute coefficients. So, as I said, this is the same price. So, with five cards, we can make it work. And that's also why we can compare cards, is because we have this very complicated interleaving. So, we do as we did before. We put them into an equation. So, our car crown has four attacks, three health, plus C, which is a charge coefficient, plus I, which is the intrinsic value of the card. And we do that for the five cards. Trust me, it's correct. Then uh, we're going to revert the attribute coefficient. Uh, to do that, we put them into a matrix, which is basically a table, and we put them like this. We say, well, for four mana, I get four attack, three health, one charge, zero divine shield, and one intrinsic value. That's the first card. Then I do the same thing for the rocket here, same thing for the Argent Square, and here you can see it has divine shield and charge, so you have one and one. And then you add the two other cards, which has uh, the divine shield. Uh, the top one was something, and the third one is the um, Argent Square. And you can see, so basically, you have your five thing. Then you apply one line of Python, which is uh, the least square, and boom, you get coefficient. And the coefficient are one for attack, the A, minus one for health, two for charge, one for divine shield, and you're like, dude, that doesn't make any sense. You can't have a discount for health. Yes, you're right. It is because we only have five cards. Five cards do not give you a good coefficient because there is too much instability. You need way more. But it's just for this example, so bear with us. It's an example. Uh, so, now how do you find the real uh, price? Well, now we're going to be back to kindergarten where you learn how to add, sh add stuff. So, you know, you have 4A plus 2H plus C plus D plus I. So, basically, what you do is you say, well, it's 4 times 1 plus 2 times minus 1 plus one plus one and the price is six. So the real value according to our coefficient is six. Well the card is fair, right? There is nothing different between the face value and the real value, so you're like, meh, not interesting. Okay, let's try again with one of the most undervalued cards in the game. The Argent Square. A lot of people said in the forum it is undervalued. Let me let's let's try again, right? Uh, so it's one one attack, one health, one damp plus divin shield plus the value of the card. So it's one times one plus one times minus one plus one plus one. Well, no, it's two. Wait, two? No, the card is one, right? And yeah, you're right. That's why it's an undervalued card. It actually should cost twice. So even with our bogus coefficient, you can always see that this guy is clearly undervalued. That's basically the idea we have. This is how it works. Um, so I post that, I did post that online and we got a lot of good feedback about it. Uh, a lot of people from Reddit, a lot of good comments. Uh, thanks to everyone who pointed out. Uh, the most important one we got was, well, dude, you should take into account dependency and it's actually true. That's thanks to Neil uh, who pointed out that charge should be basically a factor of the attack because you attack for the amount of the attack. So we now in the real model use attack time charge. Uh, same thing for Winfrey. Winfrey now we model it by taking into account the attack of the card. Uh, the one where we have a lot of debate uh, question is about Divin Shield. We don't know what Divin Shield should be. Is it just Divin Shield as a coefficient? Is it related to health? Related to attack? It's really <laughs> difficult. If you have idea, let me know. So the thing we got, so that's a comment from a someone on the blog which actually wrote me a long post saying, well, no, actually cards have a budget. And the budget is twi two times the mana plus one. I have no idea how we come up with the idea. It is absolutely reasonable and when you do it, the coefficient looks way better. It is true. I just don't know how this guy get it but thanks. So after writing code and debugging and debugging and debugging, you have something, you run it and voila, you get your coefficient. So these are the coefficient we got for 133 cards. Uh, you can see that the most valued um, coefficient is Oh, sorry, so I must mention because we use the budget idea that has been proposed, now two coefficient points is roughly one mana point. So basically, destroying a minion costs you two, uh, five mana to add to a card. A board damage costs you about 1.5 damage, uh, 1.5 mana per, per point. Uh, drawing a card costs you, a single card costs you roughly 1.5 mana. Divine Shield is pretty expensive, it costs you almost one mana point and so forth. We also have uh, negative coefficient, which is basically decrease the price of the card. As you expect, 
having your opponent drawing card is the highest one, followed by discarding cards, uh, Doom Guard, I'm looking to you here. And then we have Overload, which is a shaman mechanism, which you pay another price, right? So all of this seems perfectly fine, uh, and we were really happy. And we had this guy. Um, which is about damage. So we did something we thought was very clever, which was like let's model single target and multiple target coefficient as different. That is a stupid idea. I'm going to show you why in a few slides, but keep in mind that we tried. Uh, more than in a few slides. So one way to view visualize what it looked like as a result is uh, you have a you can put on a graph where the x axis is how much Blizzard assigns as a card as a face value, and on the y axis, how much the algorithm believes the card is uh, worse. So it gives you on the left triangle the undervalued cards that are in green, and the overpriced card on the bottom right uh, triangle. Of course, uh, because we arbitrarily force cards to be either undervalued or overvalued, you're not that interested into the one which are close to the uh, line in the middle which is like fair price. What's interesting is uh, the people who are out clear outlier and there is quite a few. The reason why we have a lot of low value cards is because when we model cards, our cards which have like shared, uh, shared ability are mainly lower value. It's not because the algorithm favor one or the other, it's just because when we did model and you can see it on the side, most of them are on the lower, on the left side of the graph. Uh, for higher card, they usually have special ability which are not captured by this model. I'm going to show you another one for those special ability just after that. So, no more blah blah. What is the result? Well, uh, the most overpriced, one of the most undervalued cards is Soulfire. Uh, we do believe it actually should be at least one mana. Uh, Light of Justice is also undervalued. Uh, this one actually triggered a lot of discussion, but then a lot of people pointed out that they do pick it into the arena. It gives you four attacks for one mana, which is somewhat of a kill if you think about it. Um, not surprisingly, Mortal Coil, Power Shield, all of them are perfectly, and Argent Square. You hear, man? I see you. And there's also Explosive Trap. Uh, somehow it actually gives you something which seems reasonable to most people. The one which is a little bit bizarre is Sacrificial Pact. Uh, it's probably a bug in the code. Um, so, and do notice we also have high value cards. Uh, the one which probably is the most overpowerful is the Fire Elemental, which we, the algorithm believe it's probably seven mana, not six. Uh, something which also has been mentioned before by people just by looking at the cards. So somehow the algorithm gives you a reasonable result. So we believe we are on the right track. Uh, if you want to look at the full detail, all the coefficient, all the card rank, uh, they're on my website. Uh, you can just go there and we keep updating it as we update the model. Uh, and if you have an idea on how to make the model better, as we said, let us know. So, how do you take it to the next level? So far we have only used a card. The question is how do you make it better? Well, it's really difficult. Uh, at least without extra data. And this extra data is uh, how people play the game. Most of the other cards depend on the state of the game and we don't have insight about it unless you have a lot and a lot and a lot of replays. Uh, of course, Hearthstone being very, very new, uh, we don't have that much replay and it's actually not a built in feature. So, fortunately for us, uh, we get our hand on a hundred games which are being played between May and June. Uh, we'd like to thank you, our anonymous friend for that. Thank you very much. And it's not a long-term solution and we really hope that Blizzard will give us the ability to see replay and allow us to do our own analysis. I do not believe it's a flow in the game. I know it's in the term of services that they don't want to do too much uh, data mining on it but having people to look at things is not, I mean if the game is perfectly balanced there is no reason to hide anything. Um, so with this data you can do interesting stuff. The first one is you can actually price card which have unique effect. Uh, let's start with a very simple example to get started, uh, the Twilight Drake. So the Twilight Drake is a card which is a 4-1 for 4 mana and have a special effect that when it comes into play, it's a battle cry, it will get, gain one health, one additional health for each card you have in your hand. So obviously the value of the card depends on how many cards you have when you played it. So you can build a model where you say well if I have one card in my hand then it has one extra health. It, yeah, and then it's one, the real value is 1.3 mana. If I have two, it's 1.9 and so forth, up to nine, uh, you have a maximum of 10 cards. So plus the Twilight Drake, the maximum is nine, or it's 5.9.
So question is now you have this table you need to use a replay data to be able to know well how people play it right are they mainly playing it with eight cards in the hand four cards two cards so you do it you draw this thing and this thing is you draw this, this exact graph and what you see is the following in the red on the left side you see when people play it with less than uh, up to four cards and the card become undervalued. Uh, basically if you play with four cards you get three mana value out of your card. If you play it with five cards at hand you have a 3.6 value and with six you have a 4.2 value. So this is the first zone where basically the price of the card is just right. If you play it with seven or eight then you get a lot of value out of your card. Uh, the average uh, real value of the card is if you take the average 3.7 which is right next to what is the predicted phase value so based on that we do assume that the twilight drag price is fair. It basically is exactly what it is. It's also interesting to show that looking at this we get the same conclusion than blizzard so we think we have something which is very similar to what they have except they have way better data and better insight. Um, let's look at another card which is one of my favorite cards and which is Van Cliff. So what Van Cliff do is for ha it will gain 2-2 two two for each time you play a card before it during the game. So all you have to do is again look at the replay and look at how many cards were played during the turn before it to get his value and for reasonable number of cards played before the game. I know you can go way below that but for the reasonable number uh, if you have a 2-2 two two it's 1.09 so one mana if you play it just like this. If you add a second card you are three mana which is roughly fair. Six six you become to get a lot of value out of it and when you play five or six cards then the value of Van Cliff is just outrageous. Uh, if you plot it, very very different plot. Uh, as you can see Van Cliff is most of the time undervalued. It is. Uh, even if you, even if it's a six six which is two cards before it, uh, uh, sorry, three card before it? No, two card before it, then you already get like a five mana uh, worth of your card. Uh, and for a four card before, you get a seven mana worth of card, and so forth. So the, av the average is 8.1. So the average value of Van Cliff today is 8.1 based on our data. So I do claim that Van Cliff is on the value, and I believe the right value is between 5 and 7 mana. I know it will make Van Cliff harder to play that's why I say we should not be 8, should not be 9 but 3 in my opinion is way too low. It is not, according to this data it doesn't make any sense. Most of Van Cliff actually I play on the ladder are actually 6 or 8. They are like people play it 4 for priest but otherwise they will do give you a 4, a 6-6 six, six, or a 8 Van Cliff which are way too powerful for the price. So this is probably one of the cards which is the most undervalued. Alright, last one. Flame strike. We got a lot of questions uh, about how you deal with uh, AOE. So cards which have a area of effect. Uh, so flame strike is one of the simplest one. What it actually do is it do four damage to every minion of your opponent on the board. Well, so easy, right? All you have to do is take count how many minions you have on the board on your opponent's side, and then multiply by the number of damage and voila, right? So just did that, and I look at these numbers. And I'm like, whoops, there is something completely wrong here, right? I mean, I show it to Stalin and you're like, well, you know, if you have two million, your card is already worth 13 point of mana. I'm like, uh, well, model is going wrong somewhere. Uh, doesn't make any sense. You can't have a 50 mana worth of card. So what's wrong? Um, it turns out it's because we use a board damage. Remember I told you we try to be clever and separated, uh, single target with versus multiple target? Turns out it's already factored in the card. And this is, how, what happened when you try to be too clever. So like, okay, let's just burn it. Let's try again. And go back to single target. Way better. No, now it makes more sense. Uh, that's how we learned that you should not use multi target versus single target. You should use only one coefficient which is bar, uh, which is spell damage, not two. And then it actually makes sense. Now the card become a good deal when you have three million on the board and not otherwise. Same thing. The graph looks perfectly fair. You can see it visually. Sometimes it's undervalued, sometimes it's overvalued. Most of the time it's between the two, so the card is perfectly balanced. And the lesson learned here is don't try to be too smart. Do not split single and multiple targets. That was one of the lessons learned. We also like this idea because it's actually looking at those cards help us validate that what we do makes sense and everything is consistent and when there is something strange we see it and we are able to adjust the model accordingly. So let's switch gear a little bit. 
uh, we're going to tell you about how you can predict your opponent deck. And I'm going to let you sell and tell you a little bit about that. So hello everybody, my name is Celine and I'm going to show you our in-game tool. So the tool uh, is a web application written in Python. It runs on a small web server called Flask. So you can display the web page just text to your game as you can see on the left side of the screen or you can also use any devices with a web browser such as a tablet. So this tool uh, this tool implements all the algorithm uh, described in this talk so you can benefit from them easily. So the main screen in our tool is a real time dashboard so you can use it to track uh, game metrics, played cards and uh, predicted cards for your opponent during a game. So the first box on top uh, displays uh, the game metrics. There are three metrics. So the mana advantage, so it's the difference between how much mana you spent and how much mana your opponent spent by playing cards. Uh, the draw advantage is the difference between how many cards you drew and how many cards your opponent drew. And the other advantage, so it's the difference between how many cards you have in hand and how many cards your opponent have in hand. So this matrix appears uh, in green if you have the advantage and in orange if the advantage is for your opponent. So we, in our study, uh, we found that um, uh, those metrics uh, are, most are the most predictive uh, of the game outcome. So we won't go into detail today uh, due to lack of time, but we will do a blog post later uh, about it. Uh, below the metrics, you can see your deck. So you can see how many cards of each type you have in your deck in the T column, so T for total. Which one of them are currently on the board in green in the P column, P for played and how many are dead in red in the D column, so D for dead. Um, so below your deck uh, there is a third box sh uh, that shows what cards your opponent played. Every time your opponent plays a card it will appear in this box. Same uh, with a total card in the T column, a played card in the P column and dead card in the D column. And so the last but not least, the final box will show you a prediction of which card your opponent is going to play based on the previous card he played. So how did we manage to get the game data? So we could use uh, packet sniffing to get the game data. It gives you the best data which is a violation of uh, Blizzard's terms of service so we didn't use it. We could use OCR for optical character recognition so it gives you good data but it costs a lot of CPU and it's not very reliable so we ruled it out. Uh, so we ended up using the debug log so you can start your game in debug mode using a small config file. It's a simple method uh, to get uh, Hearthstone data but it has some limitations like um, there's only game data, you can't see uh, your opponent uh, name, player ranks or which card attacked which card and there are also no info about decks. So it would have been great if Blizzard uh, provided uh, a log system as good as the one in World of Warcraft. So now uh, you will see our tool in action in a short video. So the tool is on the left side of the game. So I'm playing against Heli and so I choose my card and then you will see that Heli starts with an extra card in his hand because he has the draw and, and advantage. Now I'm picking up a card. So we have the same number of cards as you can see in the dashboard. There's no more advantage for Heli. So now I'm playing Argent Choir. So we can see the card will appear in green in my deck and I spent one mana point so the advantage, the mana advantage is for me. So now as the game evolves, the dashboard reflects the changes and as soon as Ellie plays a card, the prediction appears at the bottom. You can collapse your deck to get more room for your opponent info and now <coughs> he's going to play Eviserate. 
And let's get a closer look. So AV site was in the prediction. So yeah, it's work. It's working. <laughs> and at some point he tries to kill me uh, with Leroy. And good for me, I have a nice juggler. <laughs> it saved me. So I hope you liked it. So in addition to the real time dashboard, you can also uh, see the current game history in the turn screen. So it allows you to see what happened turn by turn during the game and learn from your mistakes. So our tool will be available next week on GitHub. So we currently need help with uh, to improve deck import using OCR because we currently use a text file. So we also want to uh, display the game history and do uh, the macOS and Windows packaging and improve card modeling. So if you want more info, don't hesitate to talk to us after the presentation. Thanks. Back to Elena. All right, before you get all your hopes too high uh, <laughs> and tell you about uh, how the black magic is done, uh, just a word of disclaimer. Uh, because Next Mara, which is the extension, has just been released, uh, the meta is quickly shifting, so the predictions are not accurate. As I said, we don't have access to a lot of games, so it takes a, a while for us to build a model. So expect the tool to not perform very well for the next few weeks. Uh, that being said, it will catch up as soon as the um, number of cards has been released and stabilized. So probably next season, uh, which is August, uh, end of August, I guess. Um, so how does it work? Well, so it's very simple. Uh, we model card affinity, which is which card play which each other. Then we have an evaluation function which will return what are the most likely affinity to be played based on previous card played by the opponent. And then uh, we have a tool. The tool goes through a bunch of replays uh, and then learn from those replay card affinity and what are the metrics. And then, uh, as Celine showed you, we have this tool in game which basically as the algorithm, here's the card which has been played, please return me what are the most likely cards to be up here. That's basically what it looked like. We're going to see each step at a time and that will be the last part of the talk. So, card affinity. Uh, as I said, Hearthstone have about 500 cards. So if we were to look at all the card combination, it would be almost impossible. I mean, like, for 30 cards in the deck, uh, we have like close to an impossible number of combinations. So what we really do is we expose the fact that in practice, cards really work well together and some cards do not work well together. Like if you play Druid, uh, you have the combo and the combo is Savage War plus Force of Nature. So if you have one, it's likely you have the other. On the other hand, you do not have Force of Nature and I don't know, a Murloc. Doesn't make any sense, so this is not an affinity that you need to model. So we model affinity like this. How we do that? Well, we use the simplest thing you can see of which is called n grams. Here is one of the simplest versions which is called bigram, which is modeling pairwise of cards. So what we look at is we look in the replay as a sequence of cards which has been played by our opponent regardless of the turn and we say well the armor smith has been played and then the guy plays the taskmaster so that's one big ram and we record the affinity between the two. We say well if you play the armor smith then you're likely to play the taskmaster. And then we look at the second part of the stream, which is well, the taskmaster is followed by the accolade of pain, so we record also there is an affinity between those two cards. So that being said, we know that the cards are draw at random, right? When you, you get one card at each turn, it's at random, so to model that and account for that, we relax the assumption of order and we use what we call unordered n-gram. And here are another big gram where we say, well, let's like, take every pair wise. If you play sometime during the game Armor Smith, then later on you're likely to play Taskmaster. If you played the Acolyte of Pain and you're a warrior, then you, go to, you are likely to play Armor Smith. And so we keep those. Uh, we also tried uh, three gram, which is three pairs of cards and so forth. Uh, turns out that the best model is the least constrained one, which is big gram. Um, so how do we evaluate card affinity? Well, uh, very simple again. Uh, the opponent played, uh, let's say, deadly poison the, and also sheep, which are two cards. So then from there we say, well, what is the affinity of those cards? Well, for uh, deadly poison, we know that Fan of Night has been seen 500 times and then uh, Blade Furry has been seen 350 times. So 
we we look at those. And for Shiv, we know that Blade Fairy have been seen 400 times. And if you play Shiv, we also saw uh, the Armani Berserker 400 times. So we combine them. And again, it's very simple. The simplest strategy, which is like we just sum, and we say how many times those cards appear, you get the ranking. And the ranking is Blade Fairy is on top because it's 350 plus 400. It's followed by the Fan of Knife 500, and then you put a card up wherever you want, and you say, well, this is my third prediction doesn't make it because I only want two, so I discard the harmony. That's how it works. It does. It seems very extremely simple. Turns out if you do something more complicated, it won't work. We try. I try more things. Actually, this one works really well. So how did we did? We took 550,000 replays and we did one model per class because each class has some unique card and we did not want to have cross trim. Uh, and we run the code, well first we write the code but then we run the code and we learn the thing. And then we run. And this but actually the algorithm run basically the 550,000 replays in less than three minutes so it's not as much work. And then victory. I was actually struck at how good the thing was. By turn three, the highest prediction have a 97% chance to be played, which means that out of a hundred game, the first prediction that the algorithm return at turn three will be played. Sometime in the future, we don't know if it's the next card or the card, but it actually tells you yes, this card will be played. Uh, if you want to look a little bit deeper, uh, this is the curve of prediction, the average prediction of the algorithm for 10 predictions turn by turn. You can see it actually rise because you get more and more information as turn plays. The more cards the opponent plays, the more we can look at affinity so the, the accuracy increase and then it starts to decrease after turn eight because there is less and less cards in the deck of the opponent so you have less and less chance to be right, right? I mean the, so the balance is somewhat between time four, uh, turn four and time turns eight. Um, if you look at the ranking function, the ranking function do work. Uh, the green represent our best prediction. The orange one represents our lowest prediction, which is at number 10, which choose to cut at 10. And you can clearly see that the best one is actually extremely good, up in the high 90, starting turn three, whereas the lowest one uh, is barely above 20. And they are converging because the algorithm makes less and less mistakes, but there is also less and less uh, room for errors as turn game price. So. There was a lot of things we wanted to tell you guys and uh, hindsight we should have two, took f two hours and not 45 minutes. Uh, we didn't know where we were going when we applied for the tool. So uh, we wanted to tell you about predicting the game outcome. Uh, again we'll do a blog post. Uh, we also are looking into optimizing deck for mana throughput because we know that mana advantage is the key factor to win. And also by popular request we got requests for looking at hero power comparison and also comparing uh, various type, deck of type, like why Zoo is winning versus control, uh, how it work, what is the parameter, some kind of stuff. So that's thing we are looking forward to do. If you have ideas of things we would like us to do, or if you have ideas of things we should do together, please tell us. We'd love to do it. Um, we'll give. A, we'd like to finish by giving a huge shout out to a lot of people who give us feedback. Thanks a lot. Uh, we do read uh, Reddit comments. We do read a lot of comments that people post to us. It's really important. It helps us to get better. Uh, constructive comment, please. Uh, but that being said, uh, a big thank you to people. Um, in particular, we'd like to thank uh, Neil and Zach, which spent a lot of time helping us prepare and also give us insightful feedback. And as we said, our anonymous friend who gave us a replay. So thanks a lot. <laughs>